direction is this? Does it go this way? Does it go that way? I don't remember. I've been up here like. What? Yes? No? Is it, I'm trying to figure out which way this thing gets pointed. Is it pointed this way? Say stop. If it, if it usually on, yeah, sure. Is it usually on? Yeah, okay, please. Yeah. It's my first time here. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your mercy and your blessings and your watch care over us. Father, thank you so much for um, watching over our pastor and Mrs. Waldrop. I pray tonight that, uh, that, that you will bless the study of your word. Um, I pray that we are more than just hearers of the word, but doers. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, I want to share a, a sermon with you that was written by Clarence Edward Noble McCartney in 1954. And as we go along, you would see the similarities between then and today. So let's start. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34, 4. Fear is man's enemy number one. It was the first enemy which attacked man. When at the beginning, man broke the commandment of God and then heard the voice of God walking in the garden. He was afraid and hid himself among the trees of the garden. Paul calls death the last enemy. And since man fears death, fear is, therefore, man's first and last enemy. How many kinds of fear there are? If one could take a station in front of a church in a large city and have the power to look into the hearts and minds of the thousands who pass by every day, what a multitude of fears would be revealed. Fear for the body, fear of sickness, fear for the mind, fear of poverty, fear of losing the job, fear of criticism, fear of temptation, fear of the consequences of wrongdoing, fear of loneliness, fear of old age, fear of the past, fear of things present and things to come and fear of the last enemy, which is death. Beyond these standard fears, men are haunted with strange fears, such as the fear of being buried alive. Samuel Johnson, the great lexicographer, uh, he, a uh, lexicographer, first of all, I'm, I'm not pronouncing it correctly. I pronounced it uh, 10 times correctly at home. <laughs> lexicographer, is a person who compiles dictionaries. I guess that was a job back then. Was afraid to pass a post without touching it. Some fears, some fear to pass under a ladder on the street or to sit down at a table when the number of people to be seated is 13. A gifted professor of the University of Wisconsin, William Ellery Leonard, for 35 years was a prisoner of a strange fear and never went further away from his house than five blocks. He attributed this fear to a fright he had when he was three years old. It is, not a, it is not strange that the Bible has so much to say about the subject of fear. Almost more frequently than any, anything else, it says, Fear not. Be not afraid. Be of good courage. Be of good cheer. Let not your heart be troubled. Like the sound of a trumpet, this note echoes throughout the book of Psalms. And we hear its echo in the words of the text. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Many of the fears which trouble men are altogether imaginary and illusory. A man traveling in a lonely region was terrified when he saw in the distance coming toward him what he thought was a monster. When it came a little closer, he saw that it was not a monster, but a man. And when it came still closer, 
he saw that the man was his own brother. George Herbert, the gifted English poet, had a saying about ghosts. If you see a ghost at night, the thing to do is to go up to speak to it, and you will find that the ghost is nothing more than a sheet hung out to dry. A young boy in the south who was afraid to go up into the loft of his cabin to sleep, lest he should see a ghost, was told, there are no ghosts. His answer was, I'm not afraid of the ghosts that are, but of the ghosts that ain't. Alexander the Great, on a campaign with his army from Macedonia to India, rode a beautiful black horse called Bacephalus. The horse had been brought by a horse trader to the court of Philip, Alexander's father, for use in his cavalry. But he seemed to be so vicious, plunging and kicking at everyone who came near him, that the king's horseman was about to reject him. Alexander was greatly taken with the animal and asked permission of his father to ride him. When Philip gave his consent, Alexander, who had noted that the horse was frightened by a shadow, took him by the bridle and turned his head into the sun. Then he leaped to his back and galloped up and down before the king. The thing which frightens people is often only a shadow. They are afraid where no fear is. When the disciples saw Jesus walking over the sea that night of the storm on the Sea of Galilee, they were terrified and thought he was a ghost. But he was not a ghost, but their friend and master. And soon they heard his voice saying, It is I, be not afraid. There is truth in that verse of the old hymn. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break. And blessings on your head. Let us look now at some of the common fears which assail man. First of all, is fear for the body, the fear of disease? Here the attitude of mind counts for a great deal. A man who was in good health, going on the street to his business, was accosted by a friend who told him he thought he was not looking well. A little further along, another met him and said the same thing. That, this frightened him, so that he went home and took to his bed. The testimony of physicians and psychiatrists is that a great many ailments of the body have no reality outside the mind of the one who thinks he is sick. And that which is needed is not the physician's medicine, but the medicine of faith. There are, however, plenty of real ailments of the body. The hospitals are filled with people who are really sick, yet fear makes their illness worse and the cure of it more difficult. The very mention of cancer, tuberculosis, and heart disease, three great killers, fills many with dread, a dread which keeps many who are afflicted with such a disease from consulting a, fish, a physician in time. A, Philly, a Philadelphia physician said to me of a woman upon whom I called when she was dying of cancer that had she come to him in time, he could have saved her life. But fear held her back. There is a legend of a peasant who, driving into a city in Europe, was hailed by an aged woman who asked him to take her up into his wagon and drive her into the town with him. Looking at her as they drove along, the peasant became alarmed and asked who she was. She told him that she was the plague, cholera. The peasant then ordered her out of his cart, but she assured him that in the city she would only kill ten persons. As proof of her pledge, she handed him a dagger and told him that if she slew more than ten, he was to take the dagger and slay her. After they reached the city, more than a hundred perished with the plague. The angry peasant, meeting the woman on the street, drew his dagger and was about to slay her. But she lifted her hand and told him that she had kept her word. I killed only ten. Fear killed the rest. The Christian believer must always remember, remember that even when victory over sickness is impossible, victory in sickness is always possible. The great example of that is the Apostle Paul, who had the grievous thorn in the flesh for which he besought the Lord so earnestly that it might depart from him. His request was not granted, but the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In every sickness, Christ is ready to give you and me the same promise, so that we too can say with Paul, When I am weak, then I am strong. 
The fear of poverty, the loss of money, is one of the most ignoble of fears. I have come across wealthy men who, toward the end of their lives, were obsessed with the fear of loss of their fortune. That was because their money possessed them, rather than they possessing the money. There are a number of considerations which guard against this fear of the loss of money. One is that, eventually, all of us will lose our money. In 1825, at the height of his fame, when he was living at Ab Abbotsford, his romance in stone, Sir Walter Scott's printing house failed. In his diary for that period is this entry. Naked we entered the world, and naked we leave it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I have walked my last in the, do in the domains I have planted, sat the last time in the halls I have built. But death would have taken them from me if misfortune had spared them. How often we read in the obituary, notice that a person has left so many thousands or so many millions of dollars. How true is that word, left? No matter how small or large his fortune, no man can take it with him. The great Muslim conqueror, Saladin, was buried with his hands protruding from his coffin to tell men that his hands were empty when he came into the world and empty also when he left. When Alexander the Great came back to Persepolis after his incredible conquest in India, he brought with him an Indian sage, Kalinas. They stood together at the tomb of Karush, the founder of the Persian Empire. Kalinas said to Alexander, You have troubled much of the earth, but you own no more of it than that which will cover your body when you die. That is true of us all. Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Apostle Paul said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Nothing is more certain than that. Another consideration which helps men master and conquer the fear of the loss of money is the things which money cannot do and cannot buy. It cannot buy health or a good conscience or affection or happiness. It has been well defined as that something which buys everything but happiness and takes a man everywhere but heaven. Another common fear is the fear of old age. If we live long enough, old age is inevitable and no one can deny the fact that great and strange are the changes wrought by time and age. Recently, I read the autobiography of a well-known woman on the Pacific coast, a woman who is now in her 90s. There was a picture of her as a young woman in college, then as a middle-aged woman, and then one of her in great age. As I looked at these pictures, I thought to myself, how strange are the changes wrought by age. Men fear old age because of its failing strength. They fear it because of the dependence upon others which it brings. Jesus said to Peter, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. He was speaking of the violent martyr's death that Peter was to die in his old age. But how true a description of old age that phrase is. Another shall gird thee. Men fear old age because of its fading enthusiasms. The expectations of youth is gone, and with the passing of that expectation, hope. In his old age, Joseph Jefferson, the famous actor, spent a great deal of time in his garden. When asked why, he said that with the coming of old age, many of the hopes and expectations of life faded. But when he planted things in his garden, he could at least look forward to their flowering and fruition. Again, men fear old age because of its loneliness. To live is to outlive, and old age men find that their company has gone before. There is still another reason why men fear old age, and that is because in the nature of things, old age is the anteroom to death. What can we say then about the fear of old age? One is that old age is inevitable and appointed. It is a natural as infancy or childhood or middle life. In spite of the miracle drugs and the secrets of the beauty parlors, it is impossible to fend off old age. Therefore, do not quarrel with the inevitable. 
A cheerful attitude of mind counts for much. There is a saying that we are as old as we feel. That is only a half truth. The whole truth is that we are as old as we are. But think of the achievements of old age. Moses was 90 years old before he began his great work as a leader and deliverer of Israel. The British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was still a powerful voice and figure at almost 80. Gladstone became Prime Minister for the fourth time at 83 and completed his translation of Horace at 85. Michelangelo's greatest painting, the fresco of the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel at Rome, was completed when he was almost 70. On the threshold of his 90th year, he was the chief architect of the Church of St. Peter's, the magnificent dome of which his noblest mon in his noblest monument. When he was 87, Titian finished for Philip II, the second, his Last Supper, which you can see in Spain's vast excorial. When he was almost 100, he was still producing paintings of great beauty and merit. In the words of Tennyson's Ulysses, Old age has yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end. Some work of noble note may yet be done. And though we are not now that strength which is in old days, moved earth and heaven, that's which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. The Christian man is sustained by the hope of the ageless life, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. One of the finest things on, on old age that I ever heard was a remark made to me by an honorable and aged Philadelphia physician who had retired to end his days at his ancestral home in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. What he said to me was this, so many ways to take in life, now there is just one. So many teachers I have had in life, not just one is necessary. Not, not just one is necessary. Now just one is necessary, the Holy Spirit. The fear of temptation is a worthy fear, for to fear to do wrong is a protection against sin. I once received a letter from a sailor in the Navy telling of a particular temptation to which he was subject and against which he was struggling, and how he he feared that in spite of his prayers and better purpose, he might yield to the temptation. I told him that he must face this temptation with courage and resist it at his first approach. That was the way that Jesus dealt with the temptation of the devil in the wilderness. He immediately answered the temptation with a verse from the Old Testament. The reason many go down before temptation's assault is that they delay to resist it at its first approach, to parley with the tempter, to turn the temptation over in one's mind is to open the door to ruin. I told the sailor to remember also that with the help of God and the determination of the mind, temptation can be conquered. As the apostle said, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with, will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. I reminded this sailor also what Joseph said when he was tempted in a like manner. How th then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Prayer is the great defense against temptation. It not only unmasks the face of temptation, but gives us strength when we fight against an evil thing. When Satan entered the garden of Eden to tempt man, the angel, ethereal, according to Milton, discovered him in the form of a toad and touched him with the point of his spear. The moment he did that, Satan rose up in all his malice. We must put our trust, too, when we fear temptation in the promises of God. He has promised to deliver us. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. At the end of his brief but mighty epistle in which he speaks of the many great evils which assail the church and the Christian believer, and against which he warns the believer, Jude says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. But by the fear of sin, I mean the fear of past sin and the consequences of it and the fear of judgment to come upon sin. 
The first form in which fear assailed man was a fear of past sin. When the first man, after his transgression, heard the voice of God walking in the garden, he was afraid and hid himself among the trees of the garden. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. When sin has been committed, there is the fear of exposure. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. There is also the fear of the future judgment. In view of what God has said about sin, we do well to fear those future judgments. We do well to say with the psalmist, I am afraid of thy judgments. God's beautiful and sublime remedy for sin and for the fear of sin, past and present, and the judgments upon sin is forgiveness. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. What if God let us sin, but would not let us repent? What if he let us go from him and did not call us back to him? A young woman reaching out at the, real, at the reality in her Christian faith and troubled with the re recollection of definite and specific sin wrote me in great distress and asked, Can Christ do anything for my sin? Yes, he can do everything for sin. He can break the power of sin in your life. He can forgive sin by bearing the penalty of sin himself. And he can wash out the stain of sin. These, then, are the fears which attack us in life, and these are the defenses, defenses against fear. The ideal society, as described in the Bible, is one where there is no fear. It is a society where everyone shall sit under his own vine and fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. It is the true condition of happiness. When I read those great no mores in the book of Revelation, where the heavenly life is described and where there is no more sea, that is the sea of unrest, no more tears, no more death, no more curse, no more night, no more pain. I feel that I would like to add another great no more. There shall be no more fear. When Christ was born at Bethlehem, that was what the angel said to the shepherds. Fear not, Christ came to banish fear. Over the portals of heaven are written these words, greeting man as he enters the heavenly city. Fear not. At the time of the Dunkirk disaster in 1940, when all Britain was shaken with the dread of German invasion, someone wrote this inscription over the entrance to the Heinz Head Hotel near Dover. Fear not. Faith answered, no one is here. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind, and one of the old hymns puts it so well. Henceforth the majesty of God revere, fear him, and you have nothing else to fear. The psalmist said, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. That is good, very good, but still better is what Isaiah said, I will trust and not be afraid. And finally, when Jesus was sleeping peacefully that night on the pillow in the stern of the ship, and the wind was howling and the waves were roaring, the frightened disciples awakened him and asked, Carest thou not that we perish? Jesus then arose and rebuked the wind and the waves, and there was a great calm. Then he turned to the disciples and said, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? With Christ on, on the ship with them, the winds and the waves could not hurt them. Faith is the victory that overcometh the world. Faith is the victory that conquers fear. Thank you. Okay. Uh